Wait, why is this offline? Oh, yeah, it's right. okay. Oh, yeah. Hey everybody, uh, there's pizza in the back, so uh, if you want pizza, maybe grab some now and then we'll start in a couple minutes.
I shouldn't say it out loud because it just sounds strange, but I don't know how I access the coach account. That's a terrible password.
Um, welcome to Battle Code. Hi, Professor Bob. Yeah, I'm I'm the boss. I'm one of the many developers of Battle Code. Uh, some of the other developers are, are here and in the back, uh, and there are too many of them to name them all right now. But we need to recognize people. Um, are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So. Um, as, as you all know, humanity is facing a, a great existential threat. Um, you know, the, the climate is changing, water levels are rising, and our most valuable, limited, non-renewable resources are being depleted at an unprecedented rate. Un, an unprecedented rate. That's right, I'm talking about soup. We're running out of soup faster than we can produce it, and it's, it's not going to get any better anytime soon. And, and that is the premise of this year's game, um, which is that the, uh, the, the climate is changing and, and there's only a little bit of soup on, on the map. And you have to make the best use of that to, to survive the, water, the rising water levels for as long as you possibly can. Um, so that's uh, the, the main mechanic of this year is not uh, a military focus. It's, it's the water, which is rising at an increasing rate. So every map's water level starts out at zero, uh, and, it, and at first it rises gradually. So it doesn't reach elevation one until the turn 256. It doesn't reach five until turn 1210. But by round 3000, the water level is already at, at elevation 1000. And, and you have to survive for as long as you can and or sabotage the other team so that they get flooded first. Um, so yeah, so as the water level rises, any water or any tile with water on it will spread to any, uh, any elevation nearby that has, has a lower elevation than the water level. So for example, if you start out with just one tile in the middle at zero uh, and, and the, the map is a big bowl, it'll just slowly creep outwards uh, until the entire map is flooded. And, and it's unavoidable, but you just have to survive for as long as you can. Um, the other factor is pollution. Uh, as we know, uh, refining, uh, extracting soup from, from the, the earth and, and refining it into a usable product creates a lot of pollution. Uh, and, and pollution is, is you know, bad for your health. It slows the robots down. Um, and in fact, robots get, get slower the higher the pollution is. Uh, fortunately, the, the effects are both local and global. So if, you're, if your robot is close to your, uh, your refinery, then it'll be pretty slow because of a lot of local pollution. But if you build a, a evaporator, which extracts soup from thin air and reduces pollution, your robots will be faster uh, near that building, and it will reduce the global pollution level. So every refinery, every soup refinery, when it's, when it's refining crude soup brought to it by the miners, uh, it will increase the global pollution by one every turn, and every evaporator will decrease the global pollution by one every turn. Uh, and the exact, the exact local effects are, are roughly that refineries add a fixed amount nearby, and evaporators uh, cut it by two-thirds. So it's 66% of the global pollution near evaporators. Um, and so those, those are the, the important qualities of this year's game map, uh, which is a grid of tiles. And each tile has an elevation, a, a, like whether it's flooded or not, um, how much pollution is on that tile, which is, again, the global pollution plus the local effects, which we'll, which we'll talk about in a bit and whether there's any, any crude soup on that tile that, that can be mined. Um, and, and you can sense these uh, with, with the API that we'll get into later um, with like rc.sense elevation, et cetera. Uh, is this big enough for you guys to see each other? No. Okay, great. How about now? No. In the back? No? All right. How about this? 
so refineries are cheap, but they pollute, right? And those can produce up to 20 sous per turn if they're, if they're well uh, fed by miners. Evaporators, uh, again, are, are clean, pure energy. They refine and condense soup out of thin air. Um, so they're very expensive because that's you know, pretty high tech. Uh, and they only produce seven per turn. But of course, you don't, need, uh, you don't need to bring them crude soup or anything. They just produce seven per turn for the rest of the game, unless they get destroyed or flooded, uh, and, uh, and reduce the pollution around them so that robots nearby will, will be able to move faster and not be as affected by the global pollution level. Um, yeah, so, and then we also talked about the, the design school, which is just a building that produces units. And, uh, and these all, all of the buildings except the HQ have 15 health, which means that they can have 15 dirt added to them before they're destroyed. Um, that doesn't mean that, that's, and that's 15 net. So if, if I add 10 dirt to an opponent's building and then they remove five, I have to add another 10 to destroy it. Um, and that was clear. Uh, and then the HQ has 50 health. Um, very powerful building. Don't let it get flooded. Um, the other thing that you'll see here is the sensor radius. So uh, the map is not entirely visible. Um, and in fact, your robots uh, don't even uh, share vision with each other. Each robot is controlled by an independent copy of your code. Um, so many, many games, and like if you play uh, a real-time strategy game like this, you're the central controller, you see all the units, you control them all, and you can strategize at a high level, and that's great. Uh, in Battle Code, each robot runs a separate copy of the code, and there is no central controller, um, which makes it both interesting and uh, much harder. Um, so each robot has a sensor radius where it can see the robots, it can see the soup, and it can see the elevation and water and everything within that sensor radius. And other than that, it's totally blind, except for what other robots communicate to it. Um, and we'll talk about, talk about communication in a second. But, uh, but this sensor radius is, is pretty important, and that's, that's really all they can see. And beyond that, you just sort of have to uh, either remember or, um, for example, you, if you know where your HQ is and you know the symmetry of the map, then you can like, guess where the other HQ is. Uh, but besides that, you're totally reliant on the sensor radius and the communications. Um, so communications are really important, so I'm going to talk about that next. Uh, so, so blockchains. Are, are widely useful and, and interesting and overhyped. Um, so we're using a blockchain this year for communication. Um, and uh, yeah, so every, every turn, uh, robots can submit transactions to the transaction pool, which is a message. Uh, and a transaction is seven integers. So you can, you can, any robot can say, I would like to pay X amount of soup to send this seven integer message to the rest of the world. Um, and so like many robots will submit uh, you know, message requests per turn, and then every turn, the seven messages, the seven transactions with the highest soup cost get removed from the pool and added to an immutable append-only ledger, uh, which is the blockchain. And, and in turns after that, you can see, everyone can see all of the messages added in the previous turn. So saying that a different way, um, if you're on turn 400, then there are 399 blocks of messages, which all have seven integer messages from some other robot. Everyone in the, everyone in the map can see all of these messages and, and read them at any round after they've been submitted to the, or cemented in the block. Um, and, in, and that's where you'll have useful information. So for example, um, if one of your miners discovers a large soup deposit, they might send out or submit a transaction uh, that says, well, I mean, encoded in integers that says, hey, I found this soup deposit at this soup, or I found a deposit at this location with this amount of soup or something. And then all the other miners around the map can like read the blockchain and go to that location to get all the soup. Uh, so that's the kind of thing this is for. Um, but there is the catch that um, the transactions are not, um, you don't know the team that submitted the transaction once you're reading the blockchain. You can only see the seven messages with seven integers each. Uh, so you'll need to find a way to say, or to distinguish between messages that are sent from your team uh, versus the other team. And then also, if you don't pay a high enough transaction fee, then your message stays in the pool for next round. And if it's in one of the top seven next round, then it goes in. 
So for example, if you uh, if you have a low priority message and you don't care if it gets sent this round or like 10 rounds or 10 turns from now, um, then maybe you'll have a transaction cost of just one, right? So that if, if the other team is like paying for a lot of expensive transactions this turn, it's fine if your message goes through in the next couple turns. Um, or if you, uh, if one of your robots sees uh, a wave of enemies coming towards your HQ, then maybe you want to pay a high transaction fee to make sure that message goes through immediately. Uh, and vice versa, if you see uh, the other team seeing your army go to their HQ, maybe don't want to submit a lot of high uh, expensive transactions so that they can't communicate. Um, regardless, lots of interesting mechanics to think about with the blockchain. Uh, but the point is, that's how you can get information about the global state of the world, coordinate uh, actions to have like a, a larger, more intelligent, coordinated macro strategy, uh, such as like swarming all in one place or something like that. Um, and that's, that's how you can get information outside your sensor radius. Um, okay, great. So I've already thrown a lot at everybody, so does anyone have questions about stuff that I've talked about already? There's, there's more to go, but so far, any questions? Any questions on Twitch or Discord? All right, cool. Uh, all right, well, I'm gonna keep going. Okay, so the there are a few other units and buildings which are important. Um, or actually, I should talk about units more broadly. So the difference between, uh, oh, I should, I, all right, so back in, cooldowns. Um, the exact effect of pollution on cooldowns, which is how long you have to wait between actions. Um, well, sorry, first, the cooldown. When you do an action, like moving or digging dirt or like mining some soup, um, it, in, uh, it triggers a cooldown before you can do another action. Um, the base cooldown for most actions is one. So every turn you can do one thing. You can move, you can mine a piece of soup, you can dig one dirt, you can place one dirt, um, whatever. And, and you have to wait one turn before you can do it again. However, if there's a lot of pollution nearby, then this increases. So if the pollution level is 2,000, then the cooldowns are double. Uh, it increases linearly, but just as an example. If the pollution is 2,000, wherever you are, maybe because the global pollution is high, or maybe because you're next to a refinery or something, um, uh, cooldowns, cooldowns are double. So in that case, um, you know, if the pollution level is 2,000, then you move one spot, you have to wait two turns. Then you move another spot, you wait two turns. You have to mine some soup, wait two turns. Mine some soup, wait two turns. And just like everything is really slow, so don't pollute, I guess. Um, well, don't pollute too much. Uh, anyways, so so that's what the cooldowns are, and, and all the actions have cooldowns. Um, so producing a unit and and uh, moving and digging dirt and stuff like that. Um, the units are the robots that can move around. To move, the cooldown has to be less than one. The tile you're trying to move to has to be adjacent, so one of the eight surrounding tiles. Um, the elevation difference has to be within three, uh, except for drones, which I'll talk about because they can fly. Uh, and the destination tile can't have another robot. So you can't walk onto another robot, you can't change elevation more than three, uh, and your cooldown has to be uh, less than one. And, uh, and so then, yeah, the, the unit types are miner, which I've talked about a bit. They can mine soup, deposit soup, uh, and build buildings. The landscaper, which can move dirt around, stuff like that. Um, and then delivery drones, which are the, the third unit that you can build. Uh, so delivery drones can move onto any tile. Um, I mean, you can't move onto another robot, but it can change elevation at any rate. It can walk over flooded tiles or fly over flooded tiles. Um, and it can pick up units, your units or your opponent's units. So a drone can pick up an adjacent unit as its action. Uh, so again, one of the eight surrounding tiles, and then fly it somewhere else and like drop it in the ocean or drop it somewhere across the map or, or whatever. Uh, but that unit can't do anything while it's picked up by the drone and the drone can only pick up one unit at a time. Uh, so for example, you might want to like pick up your opponent's landscapers and drop them in the ocean or you might want to pick up one of your landscapers, fly them across um, you know, a dividing body of water and drop them on the other side so that they can bury the, drone, the opponent's HQ. Um, and so when the delivery drone is destroyed, uh, the unit that it's holding is just placed on the, the tile that it, where it was destroyed. Um, and if the unit is placed on a flooded tile, then it, then it gets destroyed. Uh, 
Um, so minor, so and yeah, that, and each of these units have different costs and different sensor radius. So miners are cheap and have a big sensor radius, uh, and they're pretty fast because they're just sort of you know running around and getting soup and building other things. Uh, landscapers and delivery drones are both 150 soup and have a slightly smaller sensor radius. Um, and the drones are also slower, so their base cooldown is 1.5, which means they can move twice every three turns. Um, and that's why uh, that's why we say cooldown less than one, because the way that it would go is the drone moves one time, its cooldown is 1.5, and then it gets reduced by one for the next turn, so its cooldown is 0.5. It moves again, the cooldown is two, and then it gets reduced by one, the cooldown is one, and it can't move on that third turn. Then the cooldown gets reduced back to zero the next turn. Um, and so that's uh, also, uh, with the pollution, um, maybe this becomes 1.7 or 1.8 or 2.2 or something as the pollution level rises, and uh, the cooldowns will all still work the same way, where with the pollution level of uh, 2.5, it can move uh, twice every five turns or four turns or something. Um, yeah, okay, so the other thing to talk about is uh, this this distance squared thing. So all these all these radii are in distance squared. Um, so the minor sensor radius of 35 does not mean that it can see 35 tiles away. That means that it can see five tiles away, um, or in, in a line at least, because we use the the square distance. So there are a couple reasons for this. One is that um, since we're on a grid, uh, tiles are like fractional distances away from each other, and like fractions are hard, right? Integers are way better. Um, so every every tile is an integer squared distance away because it's just the x offset squared plus the y offset squared. Um, and this makes it so that you can think of distances all in, in integers and it's easy and you don't get any like floating point weirdness. Um, and then also because taking squared roots is a waste of time uh, and you can compare distances the same whether they're squared or not. Um, so so we use squared distance everywhere and um, We'll, we'll upload a, like a handy little graphic with uh, the base or the unit sensor radii uh, so you can see like exactly what it looks like. But a good example is, um, so for, for 24, that's just short of five. So if you have a robot in the center, sorry, which, uh, if you have a robot in the center um, right here, it can see this tile, um, but it cannot see this tile. Uh, and if you have a grid continuing up here, uh, so this this spot is a distance squared of two away. This spot is a distance squared of uh, eight away, because um, so two two squared and two squared. Um, and it can see all the way out to let's see if we have a map of two, so it can see here, um, but it would not be able to see. Uh, and so this effectively forms like a little circle, uh, uh, like the radius of four circle. Uh, so this is for, for twenty four. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll upload a little graphic uh, that, that makes that clear. So the other thing that is affected by pollution, because smog and stuff, of course, obstructs vision, is the sensor radius will decrease as uh, as the pollution gets. Uh, you know, thicker as the, the global pollution level rises. Um, and uh, this is a, a similar function to the, the cool down one where your sensor radius is halved at 4,000 pollution. Um, and the function is in the specs also. So we'll, uh, like you can, you can look up the exact function later, but again, it's a linear thing where as the pollution level rises, your effective sensor radius decreases, so your robots will be able to see less and be less effective. Um, so, so yeah, don't pollute too much. Um, okay, there is one more unit, which I haven't talked about, which you can't build and you can't control, which are cows. So cows roam around the map randomly. They're non-player characters. They'll just like move randomly around the map, and they produce a ton of pollution in the area. <laughs> So, so every cow produces one, one global pollution per turn, but nearby that cow, it's like really terrible. There's, uh, I don't remember the exact function. It's in the spec somewhere. But it's, it's something like four times the amount of pollution that a refinery has. Uh, so those cows, you really want to avoid those, and they'll just wander the map. 
Um, the cool thing is you can pick up cows with your delivery drones if you want to. So you can pick up a cow, <coughs> fly it over to your opponent's base, and then walk that pollution source right right next to their headquarters or something. Uh, and like that would be pretty fun. Um, so yeah, cows cows are the only non-player character. They just walk around studying that thing and stuff. Um, and they'll eventually get flooded also as the water level rises. But in the beginning, you know, there will be a bunch of them uh, wandering around causing problems. Um, and that's a, a, a map-specific trait. So some maps won't have any cows, but most maps will, will have cows because they're fun. Um, OK, so, so these delivery drones are very powerful, clearly. They can steal units, fly units around, drop cows in enemy bases and stuff. Um, which is, you know, undesirable. So one of the uh, other important buildings that you can build is a net gun, which is like, of course, the natural way to defend against drones. Um, and so again, built by miners. Miners build all the buildings. Uh, and net guns can shoot down drones. Um, they have a very small attack radius, uh, only 15, which means they can only shoot things within like a three, a radius of three. Um, so three tiles away and then like that circle. Um, but if, uh, if a net gun shoots down your drone, then it's immediately destroyed and drops whatever it was carrying uh, on the tile that it was destroyed. Um, which isn't bad. Like, if you can still get a cow that close, then great. But, but you lose the drone. Um, so net guns. The HQ is also uh, includes a net gun built in. Um, so, there, so you have some, some defensive ability right off the bat. But you'll likely want to defend your, your refineries abroad and, and your other buildings and stuff like that with net guns uh, so that enemy drones can't fly around stealing your units and dropping cows on you and stuff. Um, and then, okay, so the only other building that I haven't talked about is the fulfillment center, uh, which is the building that produces drones. Um, so in order to get landscapers and drones, you have to build a miner, and then the miner has to build one of these buildings, and then those buildings can produce an unlimited number of their respective units. Um, so here's here's a big table that summarizes a lot of what I just said. Um, so the soup costs of different buildings, the <coughs> amount of dirt that can be added to them before they're destroyed, and then their sensor radius and what they produce. Um, yeah, and so this is, again, all the spec public, um, so you don't have to memorize this or anything. It's, it's just available. Um, OK, any questions about the units and buildings so far? Yeah, the back. Yes, you, all, all robots get destroyed if they are standing on a flooded tile, except for drones. Um, so I'll, I'll run an example game and show you in a bit. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing is safe except for drones. Yeah. No, that's a good question, though. So the, what? Repeat the question. Oh, sorry. So, the question was, uh, can you place dirt on top of buildings so that their elevation goes up, but not enough to destroy them? And the answer is no, because their elevation doesn't go up. Um, so when you place dirt on a building, on a building, it just starts to bury the building. The elevation doesn't change. If you place dirt anywhere else, the elevation goes up. Uh, when the building is destroyed, all of the dirt increases the elevation of that tile. But a building's elevation can never change up or down. Uh, so yeah, place them wisely and or build walls around them. Uh, okay, any other questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, you can't bury, uh, units that can move around can't be buried. If you place uh, if you place dirt on a tile with a cow or like a drone or a miner or something, it just raises the elevation as if you placed it underneath the unit. Uh, only buildings can get buried. Uh, yeah, in the far back. Uh, no, you have to use your landscapers to to build protective walls uh, around your HQ, and or make sure the other HQ gets flooded first. Uh, sorry, the question was, how do you protect your HQ if its elevation can't change? The answer is build walls. Uh, yeah. Uh, like the maximum like dirt lifting or something. Uh, like does it uh, is it going like by the landscaper or by the tile? And if by the tile, then you can only like put a, a limited amount of dirt around your HQ. Uh, so the question was about uh, dirt limits. 
Uh, and the answer is the elevation can go between negative infinity and, and infinity. So you can remove as much dirt from, as you want from a tile, uh, and you can add as much dirt as you want to another tile. Landscapers can only carry 25 units of dirt, I think, at a time. Uh, it's in the spec somewhere, I think it's 25. Um, 25 units of dirt at a time. But the amount of dirt is, is infinite, and you're limited by how much time you have to move it around. Uh, Uh, the question is, can you pick up a cow and drop it in the ocean? And the answer is yes, and the cow will die. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, okay, uh, any other questions for Chris? Any other questions for Chris? Uh, the question is, can a drone hold a unit forever? And the answer is yes. Uh, yeah, but they can't pick up buildings or anything, so you couldn't just like pick up the enemy HQ because that would be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Can drones pick up drones? Can drones pick up drones? Yes, but why? <laughs> uh, can water? The question is, how does water spread? And the answer is to all eight adjacent tiles, um, and but it only only once per turn. So. Uh, I'll draw another picture of that. Uh, so, so if you have some water right here, and then this tile has elevation 3, and this tile has elevation 3, and the water level uh, goes up to you know, 3.5 or 4 or something, um, the first turn that it's above 3, it will spread to this tile and flood it. And then the next turn, it will spread to this tile. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't flood fill instantly, but it does very quickly, and you can't outrun it if there's any pollution. So so be careful. Uh, okay. Any other? These are great questions. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. The question is, if you pick up a drone with your drone and then fly in range of a net gun, can the drone that's be, that was picked up be shot? The answer is uh, not immediately, but the net gun could shoot the, the drone doing the carrying, and then that drone will be destroyed and drop its unit, which is a drone, which can then be shot by the net gun the next, the next turn, unless it like moves or something. Uh, but net guns have a cooldown, so if there's a lot of pollution around this net gun, then maybe you can only shoot once every three or four turns. Um, so maybe you'd be safe. Uh, yeah? for game breaking plays. Or yeah, okay, so the question is, uh, how much will we break the game as we update it and change things over the course of the tournament? And the answer is, hopefully not very much, uh, and we'll tell you every time we change something. Um, things that are likely to change are things like, you know, building costs might go up and down, or uh, cooldowns might go up or down, stuff like that. Um, none of the major mechanics will change, uh, but we may need to rebalance, like if one unit is too powerful, then like, we'll like, make it slower or more expensive or something. Uh, but there won't be any like game-changing changes, um, unless you guys find something really broken, but hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, well, I mean, do your worst. So, uh, all right, any other questions? Yes? Are there multiple starting points for the boat? There's like all the water. That's a great question. Yeah, okay, so the question is, where does the water start? Uh, 
And the answer is wherever we feel like putting it on the map. It could start, it could be a gigantic you know, ocean in the middle, it could be one tile in one corner, it could be five tiles randomly spread throughout the map. The only rules about the map are that uh, the water level, well, the water level function is the same for all maps. It always starts at zero and it always follows the, the table that we put. Um, the headquarters will always be between elevation like two and five, which means that if you do nothing, then you'll get flooded between round 500 and 1,000. Um, and there will always be some kind of symmetry, either horizontal or vertical or uh, rotational or some combination of those. Um, other than that, there are no uh, sort of restrictions that we'll promise, but we will promise to like be mostly reasonable. Uh, yeah, but as defined by us. So, it's, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, I believe the tie is broken by the robot ID, which is a random string assigned at creation. Uh, but other than that, like earlier built units will get to move earlier in the turn. Uh, that has never been very significant in the past. Um, but that is, yeah, the robots don't all move exactly at the same time uh, because then you could have like all sorts of concurrency problems. Um, each robot, in a single round, each robot gets to take its little turn, and then the round is finished, and then it goes again. Um, all right, any other questions? We could start demoing games. Uh, any questions from Twitch? is that I realized I hadn't set up streaming on my like, desktop that I'd set up output on. And for some reason, uh, I, I have Gradle misconfigured on this one. Um, OK, yeah, let's just do that. OK, so um, sorry, Twitch, uh, but we won't be able to show you example games right now. We won't be able to show you the client and stuff. Um, but we, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go through the setup instructions um, back on this computer uh, when, uh, when we, after we do a couple of demos. Um, yourself uh, as soon as you follow the install instructions that we will say in a few, in a few minutes. Uh, it's also on the Battlefoot website. Oh yeah, so uh, while this is happening, everything that I'm saying is on the Battlefoot website. Uh, if you haven't registered like on Battlefoot already, on the Battlefoot website. Oh, sorry, I'm streaming Twitch to the Oh, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, so uh, if you, uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, everything's on the Battlecode website. Make sure you're, you've like created an account on battlecode.org, uh, and then you'll be able to see everything at, at 2020.battlecode.org. Uh, and that's where you can like create a team, join teams, read, uh, I don't know if the spec is there yet, but there are links to like all of the important things like Discord, which you should join if you haven't already. That's a great place to ask questions, not in person, um, to the Twitch, to the setup instructions, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so what you're seeing now is example funks player, which is the example code that we have bundled with, uh, with battle code. Um, so this is an example player that just produces miners which move around randomly, including into the ocean sometimes. Um, <laughs> wait, do they? 
They might be sleeping with them. Uh, well, if, if they're standing on a tile, they can get flooded. But, but yeah, so the game just ended because the two HQ spots got flooded. If that happens, the tiebreaker is the total, is like your net worth, like the total amount of, the total value of all the units you have plus the amount of soup uh, that you have stored in your, in your team pool. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is an example where you need drones in order to interact with the other player. Uh, but, but right now, these, these games aren't lasting super long. So like you can see this one only goes to 690 rounds. Um, and uh, that's because it doesn't do anything intelligent. But uh, if, you know, if, this, if the bob were to produce landscapers, it could like, build up some walls around the HQ and uh, maybe survive a little longer. Uh, but that is for you to do. And we'll, uh, we'll show you how to do stuff like that over the course of the next uh, week or so. Uh, We'll, we'll improve example funks layer together, sort of as we, as we go on. Um, and, uh, oh. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, so this is the client. Do uh, you want to show them how to run a game? Oh, cows. Oh, nice. There are cows on this map. That's pollution. <laughs> yeah, so the great, the great out part is the, the local pollution around the cows. And it's kind of hard to see, but when, when units get near the cows, they like slow down some. Oh, there, everything's moving here randomly. But <laughs> regardless, um, wait, what is the brown? Uh, dirt. Oh, that's just a, a yes. different yes. Uh, But yeah, so there are all kinds of example maps already. We're going to be adding more, of course, throughout the tournament, um, or throughout the competition. Uh, but but yeah, so this is this is what the game looks like um, at the moment, and now uh, we can show you how to get this set up on your own computer. Oh, uh, okay. So, how to get started? The answer is go to the Battlecode website. Oh, the specs are changed up. The specs will be up soon, but they're they're in the uh, the public Battlecode repo. Uh, so, all right. Anyways, so this is this is what it looks like when you first go to the website. Uh, 2020.battlecode.org. Uh, you can see recent updates and uh, these useful links. Um, so the things that we want right now are getting started. Um, so depending on your operating system, it's a little bit different, but it's pretty much the same for everyone, which is you have to have Java installed um, because the bots are written in Java this year and you need to be able to compile them. Um, and then it should be pretty straightforward uh, to get like Battlecode itself running. Um, you just download, so the Battlecode scaffold is the thing that, uh, okay, this is too big, but this is the thing that will like get the most recent version of the Battlecode engine and the client and all of that and, uh, and run it for you. Um, so you just have to download or clone this repo, which like we'll, we can go through uh, in a second. But what that looks like is you just go over here and you click, you copy this link and then you can, uh, I'll put it somewhere else. Uh, so just get clone, um, or you can like download it as a zip and use your uh, favorite folder system to, uh, um, to extract it and everything. But inside this folder is, is the, the important thing, which is great old W. Um, and so this is, this is how you do all the battle code commands. Um, so there are, um, you can use the command line or you can use uh, an IDE. So there, it will work, it will, or it, it should just work um, with, <laughs> IntelliJ idea, idea and Eclipse, which are like two of the most popular Java editors. Uh, but you can also use the terminal. Um, so, and there are, there are instructions for all of these. Um, I'm gonna use the terminal because I don't think I have either of those installed at the moment. Um, but the, uh, I don't know, the, like, slow, the slow way to do it, the terminal way to do it is uh, you can use this Gradle W thing and do Gradle W build and then that will like download a bunch of stuff, and uh, 
it'll take a little while because there are a lot of us in this room, but I've thankfully already done it here. So that will download a bunch of stuff, um, like the engine and the client and stuff like that. Uh, and then all you have to do is, uh, so you can, oh yeah, you can also see, um, if you ever forget this stuff, you can go to the getting started page or you can um, just do Gradle, uh, Gradle W uh, dash Q tasks. And that will like, oh, that's a dash one, um, dash Q tasks. And that will like list all of the, uh, all of the tasks that you can do eventually. Um, so the battle code specific ones are, uh, you can like build, uh, build your player. You can list the maps that are options. You can, uh, you know, run, run a match without starting the client and stuff. Uh, but don't do that because it's, uh, like not as fun as using the GUI. Uh, instead use the fancy battle code client that we just saw, which if, uh, if it were working for me, um, would just be an executable inside the client folder, but it's not working for me. Um, so when you set that up, we'll see if it works for you or not, and we'll debug each of your computers. Um, I suspect the problem is that I messed up my job install to some things. Um, but anyways, uh, it, should, it should be that easy. Um, Java is not maintained by us, so it's really easy to install and stuff because Oracle wants you to use Java. Uh, and then the, the scaffold uh, should just be a matter of running Gradle W build and uh, will help you solve any problems that arise when you do that. Um, past that, you can run matches and stuff like you saw on the client. Uh, it's all fairly self-explanatory, but again, if you ever have questions, please ask us uh, because that means we should make it better uh, and because we can help you. Um, scrimmages. so. Uh, you'll, starting tomorrow or so, uh, you'll be able to upload your bot to the website and scrimmage other players uh, to see, you know, how you stack up against uh, other teams. Um, and eventually we'll have like auto scrimmages also so that we can, uh, with like an ELO system or something like that, so that we can uh, seed people for the tournaments. Um, the overall schedule is uh, a week-ish from now will be the sprint tournament. Um, which has like a small prize for the person who like managed to get the most code written in the first week. Um, it doesn't really impact anything. It's mostly just so that uh, we can have like a fun tournament right off the bat and, uh, and you can sort of like get ideas for strategies that work from the, the people who have the best strategies in the beginning. Um, a week-ish after that, we'll have the seeding tournament, um, which is another tournament that just exists to uh, figure out the seeds for the final, or the qualifying tournament. Uh, these are all double elimination. So then the qualifying tournament will be a double elimination tournament seeded by the seeding tournament results. And the top 16 teams from that will make it to the final tournament, which will be here in person, the last weekend of IP, uh, which is like February 1st-ish, plus or minus a day. Um, and that's when the top 16 teams will compete for the like massive grand prizes, and then we'll also have a, uh, a side competition for high school students. A side competition, wait, right? This one? Yeah. So, yeah, a side competition for high school students. Um, a side competition, all with prizes. A side competition for MIT teams who is whose first time competing. Um, so not that you can't win the qualifying or the regular tournament if it's your first time. Um, it like, helps to have some experience, but we have like plenty of first time people every year. Um, but we hold a separate tournament because we like MIT students, you know, more than other people, obviously. <laughs> uh, uh, so we have a special tournament for, for you guys. Um, and then uh, there will also be, uh, a, the qualifying tournament will be split between U.S. and international, uh, just because we can't fly in 16 international teams if there happen to be really 16 really good teams, because, like, flights are expensive. Um, but the exact breakdown of like uh, which proportion of which, uh, or which proportion of each we'll, we'll be taking uh, will be announced later. Um, but yeah, so the most immediate things are sprint tournament in a week or so, and more lecture tomorrow where we'll start improving example pubs player. But the last thing that I want to do tonight is just start going through example pubs player just to show you sort of how to interact with the game world. 
and uh, I'll show you what's uh, what's going on with that. So example fonts player comes with um, comes with the scaffold, and this is where you should put your box. So right now the only box in the source folder is example fonts player. If you wanted to make a new one, then you would just say like you would say folder my box. Oh, I didn't realize it wasn't here. Uh, let's see. This is a all. Oh, we're good. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. Uh, Okay, anyway, sorry, so um, backing out. So right now I'm just in the battle code scaffold folder. Um, there's a source folder, and this is, this is where your bots go. So right now the only thing in here, uh, the only thing in here is example function player, um, but this is, where, this is where you'll add yours. Um, but if we want to edit example function player, or just look at it, we can go here and Um, yeah, sorry, there was a, there was a bit of a bit of glitch here. Um, uh, which I think I opened last time I was in Splice. Okay, um, so, right, uh, we don't want this, we want robotplayer.jump. Okay, so the file that every robot needs, or every bot needs, is robotplayer.java, which is way too small for you to see. So I'm going to make it bigger as soon as Sublime stops being sad. Um, and then, why did I just see that? Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so every every uh, uh, bot needs this robotplayer.java in the in the base folder. You can't see it because of this thing, but if I, all right, whatever. Um, inside, just inside of the example funds player folder is robotplayer.java. And so that's the file that the battle code engine is gonna look for, for your bot. Um, you can have lots of other files. Um, you can just like create a bunch of things and then import them in robotplayer.java. Um, but everybody needs robotplayer.java and it looks like this, can you see it in the back? Yes, great. Um, okay, so uh, this is what Java looks like. Um, you may notice that there's a lot of there are a lot of there's a lot of syntax, a lot more than with Python or something. Um, but that's okay. It's because Java is typed, um, and it and it needs to know all the types of everything. Um, so just as a sort of rundown of what's happening on each line, this first line is declaring um, what package uh, this this piece of code is in, and the reason you need to do that is because the engine is going to import your robot as a, as a package itself and then run it against some other robot which it imported. So you just declare this to be uh, whatever your, the name of the folder is that you create, and, uh, and that's all that is. The import battlecode.common.star is import everything from the battlecode library. Um, this is the kind of stuff like the game constants, this is the robot types, so like this robot type thing, this is a type that's imported by battlecode. The robot controller, which is how you're gonna interact with the game world, all of that gets imported by battlecodes or battle code common. Um, and then the first, this line, line four, is the, is the first, um, the first line of like your own code, which is the, uh, the class that everything is wrapped in. Java wants everything to be wrapped in a class, so that's how it is. This line, like, you don't need to know what it means, but it basically just means that this thing called robot player is a class, it's public, and there's something strict about it that I don't know. Um, these are uh, just like variable declarations. So in Python, uh, you don't need to declare your variable types or anything like that. You just say, you know, uh, like x, uh, x equals five or something, and that's, that's it. Uh, in Java, they want you to say int x equals five, so that if you try to say int x equals 5.7, it can yell at you and protect you from yourself. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, so that's that's what all this is. And the static just means that there's only oh, whoops, there's only one copy uh, for this class since you're only going to have one anyways. Uh, it doesn't particularly matter. Um, if you change it from static, you'll get errors. So do that. Okay. Um, so all this is saying is that there exists a variable RC that is of type robot controller. Um, the next line is very similar, but it's uh, an array. So that's what that's what these two things mean. Um, so like in Python, again, you would just say, you know, durs equals. Um, you would just say durs equals blah 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 blah. I mean, that's illegal because whatever. But you know what I mean. So, but in in Java, the way that you initialize uh, an array like this is you can say static direction, this symbol. So this is an array of direction objects um, is equal to, and then uh, you can have this this array. Um, there are more directions than this. There's also northeast, southeast, et cetera, et cetera. But example funks player only moves uh, in the four uh, sort of cardinal directions randomly. We'll add more as uh, as the lecture player improves uh, over the next week. Um, but an important thing to note about Java arrays as opposed to Python ones is that you can't change their size. So this directions thing is, is size four forever. Um, and you, you can't do something like you know, directions plus equals or whatever, or append or something like that. If you want to do that, use an array list. Um, if you Google Java array list, you will find the answers that you see. Uh, I mean, just about array lists. Um, so, okay, so the, that's like arrays and stuff. Um, so, okay, and then this, this direction thing, this is a, uh, so direction is something you imported by, from, from battlecode.com, and this is just, again, some, something that we provide. So, instead of um, using like numbers or something or strings or whatever to define our directions, we, uh, we just made uh, what's called an enum. Um, all that matters is that you can use equals with them. So you can say, like you can have some direction, and you can say if if dir equals equals north, or direction dot north, then do something, otherwise do something else. Um, or if like some one direction one equals direction two, then do something. Um, and it's just like a nice, a nice readable way to refer to the directions instead of saying like zero, one, two, three, or something like that. Uh, and then same thing with the robot types. These are like constants provided to you. Um, robot type dot refinery is a fixed value like you can think of it as seven, uh, and you, you won't be far off. Um, uh, but yeah, so that's just like a bit about Java. So, so robot player is the one file that you need. Robot, the robot player class is the one class that you need in the robot player file, and public static void run is the one function that you need in your robot player class. Uh, public again just means that we can import it and see it. And use it. Static means that there's only one copy. Void means that it doesn't return anything. And run is the name of the function. And it takes one argument, this robot controller RC, uh, which is again how you interact with the game. And it can throw a game action exception, uh, which we'll talk about later. That's basically just if you try to do something illegal, like move on to another robot, then the engine will throw an error at you. And you have to uh, you have to either do something with that, which is like the good thing to do, or you can just say throws game action exception on this function, and then if it gets one of those, it will just give up and throw that to whatever called it. Um, if you do this, your robot will probably explode. Um, I'm like 95% sure that if you throw an exception, your robot explodes. Um, if you throw an exception and catch it, um, then there's a, a bytecode penalty, which I'll talk, I'll talk about bytecodes in a bit. Um, so there's like a slight penalty, uh, but your robot won't explode. So make sure you like catch, check for exceptions and catch them if you if you're trying to do anything risky like move or you know whatever. If you like if you check, we provide functions like RC .can move and then RC .move. So you shouldn't have to get any exceptions if you like check if you're allowed to move first. Uh, and we'll see that we'll see that down below. Uh, but yeah, that's that's all this line means. This is the required function in the required class in the required file. And this is where all of your code goes and you can forget about everything above line right here. So um, RC, again, is how you interact with the world. So 
for example, um, again, each of your robots is going to run a separate copy of this file. So when a single robot says rc.getType, um, for some copies, that will be minor. For some copies, it will be drone. For one copy, it will be hq. Um, and this will just log uh, the type of the robot. And I'm going to try to build this in a minute. I want to build this right here. Uh, uh, sorry, I, wanna, I really want to show you this, so I'm just going to keep trying. I'm going to try to get back and see if it works. Um, <coughs> Okay, great. So I'm going to be able to run this. Okay, so um, yes, these what wonderful developers we have. Okay, so uh, anyways, right. So this this is uh, one of the ways that you can figure out what the heck is going on inside your program is with print statements, um, and I'll show you where they show up in the client in a bit. Um, but here is the uh, the sort of main main thing. Um, this is going to loop forever for a reason we'll see in a second. Uh, and, and count up the number of turns that this robot has been alive. And then every loop, it's going to say, okay, depending on what type I am, run the code associated with that robot. So like, if it's a miner, maybe it's moved randomly. If it's an HQ, it's like build miner. Uh, and then yield at the end of the turn. And so this is really important. Clock.yield is what tells the engine that you're, you're done doing stuff for this turn and you're ready for the next one. Um, the engine will cut you off. If you like do, if you try to do too much in one turn, um, and uh, and so this is like a controlled way to say like when the split happens. So you're going to run all of your code, and then you do clock dot yield. Uh, all the other robots will go, and then the engine will resume on the next line. So it'll go, it'll you know catch exceptions, which is always a good thing, so that your robots don't explode. Um, and then it'll go back to the top of this loop, and it'll run the uh, it'll run the appropriate function. Um, this is a very high level of sort of like what every turn is like. You do a bunch of stuff, you yield, you catch exceptions, so your robots don't want to explode, uh, and, then, and then continue on the next turn. So let's look at an example, or actually no, I can just show you, I can show you where these print statements come out. Okay, so resuming from earlier, the way that you run the client if you are on Linux, uh, there are instructions for every operating system, but the way that you can do it on Linux is to do uh, dot, uh, go into the client folder and then dot slash dot code visualizer. That brings up our, our great client for this year. And then you can click on the runner tab to like choose two bots to run against each other. Right now, I only have the example host layer. Um, so I'll choose central or, I don't know, or lake land because that sounds good. Uh, and then I can click run game, and you'll see some like vital signs over on the left here. Uh, and then the game should start going like this. So the game is, uh, it already finished running. Um, it took 678 rounds, and we're just like watching a replay right now. Um, so let's, let's get to the part where we get to Oh, that was a weird thing. Uh, okay, so that wiped out a bunch of units. Uh, it's hard to tell right here, but those tiles were a slightly lower elevation. Um, we're going to be like adjusting the client so that it's, it's easier to see because I don't know if you guys can see it well. Um, uh, but anyway, so so this map is getting flooded and then it's going to end. Um, and if you want to see what a what is actually going on here, you can go to these logs and see all the print statements that's happening that, that are happening, um, or or you can click on a specific robot and see what they're doing. So this HQ, uh, don't mind that circle, it'll be gone in a minute. Um, <laughs> so this HQ is printing every round. I'm in HQ location 1010, which is, if you remember, exactly what we told it to do right here. Oh, wait, no, just got created. The HQ prints uh, run HQ try build. Hold on a second. What? Location. Oh, right here. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so on the turn it's created, it 
prints that it got created, and then every round it prints its type and where it is. Uh, so if we instead clicked on this miner, we can see that the location has been changing because uh, it's been moving around randomly. And then as we as we play the game, uh, it'll it'll keep printing more stuff. Um, and you can always see you can always see uh, exactly the robot ID, which is going to be unique to, you know, to help you figure out which unit is which. Um, and the uh, and the turn number, uh, which is which is useful for seeing what things happen. Uh, the cool thing about the Battle Code Engine is that if you run the exact same game twice uh, on the same map between the same robots, it will go exactly the same way. Uh, and this is again because of the bytecode thing that I'll talk about in a second uh, after I show you how to run matches more. Um, but what that means is like if you see one of your miners jump into the water, which would be dumb. You can try to change your code some, and then play the game again, and like watch it happen again or not happen, uh, and then hopefully you can get it to not happen. Uh, we also provide a bunch of other debugging tools, uh, which aren't being demoed in Example Punks Player yet, um, but are documented on the site or will be shortly, uh, like within the next couple of days. Um, but the main thing right now is these, is these print statements. You can see exactly what each robot is thinking on each round, uh, as long as you, you just have to print it out. OK. So let's see what the miners are doing. Um, oh, also, this is similar to a Python switch statement. It's just like uh, slightly different syntax. But um, yeah, that, that's all good. We'll, we'll look at the run miner. OK. so if the, if the type is a minor, um, and again, we can have these like nice and readable names because of the battle code import, so yay. Um, so the minor will first try blockchain, and so let's see what that does. So the try blockchain says if, uh, if, you, if your turn count is low, then you try to send a new message. Um, this array is, should be size 7. Um, I guess if you send a bigger one, it'll just not get it. Um, so it sends a message, and it just, in this case, the message isn't very meaningful. It's just a bunch of 123s. Uh, but you could like make the first number the, uh, the like some random value associated with your team, and then the second number, the round number that you sent it on, and then the third number, like what type of message it is, and then the fourth number, a location, or something like that. For now, it just fills the message with useless garbage, and then checks if you can submit the transaction um, for a transaction fee of 10 soup. Um, so again, if, the, if there are seven messages that have more than, that cost more than 10 soup, then this one won't go through this round. But if it's in one of the top seven transaction costs, then it will go through this round. Um, and again, if it doesn't go through, it stays in the transaction pool and, and may go through a later round. Um, so yeah, if it can submit this, this message, then it does that. Uh, and this is a, a common pattern that you'll see, um, where you, you do like if rc dot can do action, do action. Um, and I think I think we'll see that in the, in the movement piece. Um, but just a small note about Java syntax. This is misleading because it looks like Python, where you just like have an if statement and then you indent, and then there's another line. Um, but this is sort of a syntactic sugar thing that, that Java has. This is equivalent to doing this. Like you, you have, I would always put curly braces on if statements and for loops and stuff like that. Um, it will run everything inside the curly brace. It doesn't care about indentation. The entire, all of the code could look like this. And it will still run just the same. In fact, all of the code could look like this. And it will still run just the same. Um, but don't do that because you'll be sad. Um, but yeah, you can have it all in one line if you want to do that. Um, great. Uh, so let's not do that. Uh, never mind, I'll just do it this way. Um, okay. Uh, right, so anyways. Undoing all that. Uh, let's back to where we were, which is, okay, yeah, so 
that was just a, a tangent about JavaScript tags. Uh, let's take a look at the uh, the other function in run minor, which is try move random direction. Um, so try move is going to uh, I lost it in try move. Uh, it's okay, so static boolean try. Um, so what this means is again it's a static function, pretty much everything should be static. Boolean means it returns true or false, uh, and then that's just the name. So this loops through every direction in the directions. This is a there are a couple of different ways to do for loops in Java. Uh, you can do um, this is a for each loop. You can also do the one that we saw at the bottom, where you like just loop through a bunch of numbers. Um, I think there are examples of all the types in here that you can uh, mix and match as you please. But basically all it does is it uh, loops through all the directions, tries to move in that direction, and then returns true if it succeeds. So the try, this try move function, notice it has the same name, which is not allowed in Python, but is allowed in Java because it's actually a different function since it takes one argument. So this try move is called the same thing, but it takes no arguments. So it's totally separate from this try move, which takes a direction argument. Um, the reason that this is cool is that if you have a bunch of functions that do the same thing, like a go-to function, your go-to function could take a direction or a location or whatever, and you don't have to care. You can just say go-to whatever, and it'll like go in that direction if you set it up that way. Um, but anyways, separate function, it has different arguments, so it's different uh, in Java. So this one takes a direction, and this one checks if our rc dot is ready, which will check the cooldown and stuff like that, and rc dot can move in that direction. So rc dot can move will check all the things that I talked about before about like cooldown and elevation and whether uh, there's already a robot on that tile or whatever. Um, and and if it's possible to move, uh, <coughs> then that will return true. And then we do rc dot move direction and uh, and return true. And that's it. Like that's all the code that we just saw is is everything that you need to get the miners to like wander around the map randomly. Um, so um, so yeah, the, the API is pretty high level. Like um, you just you know sense your surroundings. I don't know if there's a, there isn't a, there isn't an example of that in here yet. Uh, but there's like RC dot get nearby robots, which will like show you all the robots nearby, and then you can just loop through those robots and like check what team they're on. Or check their location or something like that. Um, and then move towards them if they're on your team or move away from them if they're on the enemy team or something like that. Um, but it's all very like, uh, you know, each, each robot has properties the same way Python objects work. So I don't, uh, all right, there isn't, a, there isn't an example in here yet, but there, there will be tomorrow for the first lecture where we improve example function error. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that was, uh, that, that's like the basics of, of how to move around. The last thing I want to show you to show all the, uh, all the stuff that we've seen so far is run HQ, which um, just tries to build a robot in every direction until it succeeds. Um, so let's look for the try to build function. Yeah, so here it takes a robot type and a direction. So it checks if you're ready and you can build the robot. So again, this is everything that starts with RC is like stuff that we provide. Um, and this and and is how you, this is the equivalent of and in Python. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so the checks is, are you ready? Is your cooldown low enough, etc.? And then can you build this robot type in this direction? So again, that will check like A, if you're even allowed to build that robot type, like, you know, drones can't build anything, so that would always be false. And if that direction is, is empty, so if there's like a robot in the way or something. Uh, and if so, then rc.buildrobot type direction. And that will spawn a new robot, pay the soup cost, all that good stuff um, automatically for you. And, uh, and that's, what, that's what we're seeing in, uh, in this game. Is the HQ from time to time, random chooses like a random direction to build a, a robot in and just uh, builds a miner. Uh, and then the miners, like, try all the directions and see which one they can move in. 
And, uh, and that's it, that's, that's all of this behavior is, is just one of those few lines of code. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll get into a bit more of, of the details, or a lot more of the details about like how to go about writing more of this and like making it do more intelligent and complicated things as the, mostly over the course of this week. Um, but for now, this is like sort of the basics um, that you can sort of, at the, at the very least, you know, copy and paste and mix and match to like see if you can get it to do something more intelligent. Um, and uh, okay, yeah. So the last thing, or sorry, any questions about that so far? That's that was kind of a lot, especially if you haven't seen the demo before. Any questions about Twitch or Facebook? Oh yeah, if you if you were over eager and downloaded the most recent or the scaffold right when you saw the URL on my computer at the beginning, you should pull one of the, the more recent versions. If you haven't done it yet, then don't worry. Hopefully you'll get the right thing. Um, okay, great. The last important game mechanic that I want to talk about is bytecode. So going back to the spec. Um, Bytecode is a measure of computation. So instead of using time uh, to limit how much your robots can do, um, and say like, you know, you get 10 or 20 milliseconds of computation and then that, that's it. Uh, that has the problem where like sometimes your computer is going faster, sometimes it's going slower, sometimes it gets cut off at different times than others, some robots may get more time than others. Uh, and like if you run the same game twice, it's gonna be different. Uh, because like the time cutoffs might happen differently. Um, fortunately, Java has an instrumenter, which means that we can have very fine grain control over uh, like the code that's executed. So Java gets compiled into this thing called Java bytecodes, and each bytecode is like one basic operation. It's kind of like assembly, uh, but it's like Java's slightly higher level version of that. Uh, but this is something like uh, subtraction or like get field or something like that is, is one bytecode. Um, and and this is like, these are like actual codes, like line by line codes in a compiled Java program. Um, and so we can, we can count them. If you compile the same program twice, it's always the same bytecodes. Um, and we can say like, oh, you get to run a hundred bytecodes or a thousand bytecodes and then like that's it. Uh, and, and we can have very fine grained control of like the exact amount of computation that you get to do. Um, and the answer is that, uh, is this, this year. So uh, the HQ gets 20,000 byte codes per turn, netgun 7,000, other buildings 5,000, and all units are 10,000. Um, so what this means is that you can do as much computation as you want, but after byte code 10,000, we're gonna pause your program, let everybody else go, and then resume it. Um, so you won't explode or something um, from, from using too many bytecodes. You just might take two turns to do one turn worth of activity or more. Um, and you might run into problems where like, if you, if you say, if rc.can move, and that's like your last bytecodes, and then it, it stops you, and all the other robots go, and then you resume from the same spot, RC dot move, like maybe that's an illegal move now, and then your robot explodes or something. Um, so you want to be careful about that. But the program won't like be crashed or or stop or anything like that. It's just like politely pause, and then it will resume the next time if you go over the bytecode limit. Uh, however, of course, you want to stay below the bytecode limit so that you can do one turn's worth of activity per turn instead of like doing a bunch of computation, running over the time limit, and then moving the next turn when you could have moved last turn or dug some dirt or something like that. Um, and in the in the client and stuff, you'll you'll be able to see when when robots are going over the bike code limit and stuff like that. Uh, so so yeah, so that's how that's how we limit computation. Um, and like ten thousand bike codes seem like a lot. Um, you can do a lot of stuff with ten thousand bike codes. Some things that people have not been able to do usually within 10,000 bytecodes is something like A star, uh, which is a search algorithm. And if you have like a 
a largish map. So the maps are going to be between 32 by 32 and 64 by 64. Um, so, so even on the, the smaller maps, if you're trying to like find a perfectly optimal path from one side to the other, um, you're probably going to time out. Uh, so, so maybe you'll have to use like more uh, imprecise navigation, such as walk in the correct direction, and if you can't, go to the side, uh, or something like that. Uh, and there are like more intelligent ones, you know, like bug nav or tangent bug or something like that, uh, which people have successfully implemented because those are, are a lot more efficient than, than like A star or something. Um, but that's sort of just an idea for like how uh, how much computation you get per turn. Definitely enough to like loop over all of the nearby robots and like think about them a little bit and then move. Uh, not enough to do like a lot of complex uh, a lot of complex algorithms every single turn. Uh, but of course, since the HQ gets more computation, maybe you can do a lot of computation in the HQ and then put the results on the blockchain so that all the ben all the units can benefit from it, uh, which is something that is very common. Uh, for example, you can have the HQ pre-compute the optimal direction to move to get to the opponent's HQ, and then like so save that somehow. Um, I don't know, that's kind of hard, but you can do it, it turns out. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's what bytecodes are all about. Um, if you want to know more about how they work, they're very cool, and you can check out the, the Wikipedia page. Um, but the way that it affects you is just, um, there are, all the code that you write is kind of like have some bytecode costs, and then we override, um, we override uh, the cost of some functions, which would be more expensive, but we like don't want to penalize you for using. So for example, um, block.yield is zero bytecode because you're trying to end your turn anyways. Um, and like checking how many bytecodes you have left and stuff like that should be <coughs> zero bytecodes. Um, things like direction two or distance squared two or something, these all have small bytecode costs of, of just two. Um, so like checking the distance squared between two locations uh, only costs you two bytecode instead of like whatever it would be if you implemented it yourself. Um, like equals and hash and stuff like that are all pretty cheap. All of the uh, all of the like game interaction things, so like can move and can pick up units and stuff like that. These all uh, have have slightly higher costs, so like ten or twenty five. Um, reading the blockchain is expensive because communication is very valuable. Uh, so that one costs a hundred. Uh, but these are all. This is also good. Uh, a good list just to look at, to like see all of the possible functions that you can do to interact with the game. Uh, but then down below, we also override a bunch of math things, so like all of the, you know, uh, trigonometric, trigonometric functions and stuff like that are all cost one in case you want to use those. Um, so this just has a big list of like things and their costs. Um, and the way that I got there is there's a link in the spec right here. Um, uh, but yeah, so so that's all my codes are for is for like limiting the amount you can do per turn um, to make sure that you're being efficient and, uh, and the games run in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so yeah, that is, uh, that's, that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about and show you. Um, there's other stuff in this game where you could like see games that you've already, that you've already played, you can run more games. I don't know what help does. Uh, help, help tells you, ask on Discord and some keyboard shortcuts and stuff. Um, and then, yeah, you can see logs, you can see game statistics, like the number of units and stuff. Um, but uh, that's, that's pretty much it. I, uh, do, does anyone have any questions? Just, just switch up to questions. Okay, I, uh, oh yeah, question in the back. So the question is like, what what do units actually get to see? Like, how could they possibly try to compute a uh, path from one place to another? Um, the answer is they only see what's around them, but they may know of locations outside their vision radius. So, for example, like, I mean, you know where you were spawned from the HQ or something. So, like, if you go halfway across the map, you know that you need to get to this location, and you can like find an optimal path within what you can see. For example, um, or you could like do something fancier where you remember where you've been and then you pass through that or something. 
actually ask good questions. Uh, okay, so if there aren't any other questions, I would encourage you all to try to get it set up while you're here and while we can like help you debug any issues. Uh, again, it should just work uh, if you go to the Palo code dashboard and follow, follow the installation instructions here. But if it doesn't work, then we want to know now so we can help you fix it. Uh, but yeah, other than that, good luck. Uh, we'll stick around for questions and debugging. Uh, also, if you need a team, uh, if you don't have a team yet, teams are really helpful. Um, stick around here. Other people looking for a team will be here. They just like come down to the front or something. There's also a team uh, team building, I think. Uh, team team something channel on Discord. Uh, if you want to like find other people around the world who are good about building a team, so uh, feel free to look there also. But yeah, if you want to find a team in person, come down here. If you need help or have questions, also come down here. Otherwise, good luck and see you tomorrow at the same time and place. And we'll start improving example pump player making it to intelligence.